Hello? Is this, is this microphone on? It is, right? All right. Well, welcome everybody to our first Humanities Forum of the semester. Our first, but not our last. If this is a, your first time at the Humanities Forum, welcome. If you're a, a grizzled veteran, you know, welcome back. Let me tell you what it is and why are you here. The Humanities Forum is an initiative of the Humanities Program and it's an opportunity for us to come together as a Providence College community to do a few things, such as explore ideas and important questions outside of the classroom, deepen our appreciation of the humanities and humanistic inquiry, and explore and learn from scholars with diverse perspectives and fields of expertise. So in other words, you know, more simply, it's an opportunity for you to encounter new ideas and think about the big questions in our world today. This semester, we've got a whole slew of interesting things ranging all the way from Greek tragedy up to 21st century medicine. You'll be getting emails from me regularly, inviting you to go to them, and I hope you take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, the structure of what we're doing today runs as follows. I'll stop my throat clearing and turn it over to our guest. We'll speak for 35, 45, something like that, minutes. After that, there's a question and answer session with two rules, one being student has to ask the first question. So I started thinking now, is this going to be crickets otherwise? And also wait until, you've, you've got your hand up, wait until I've run over and given you the microphone so that your words can be immortalized. Uh, and then after, you know, 15, 20 minutes of Q&A, we'll decide that we've, we've, we've reached an end and we'll shuffle down the hallway to the Fiendella Great Room where there's reception, so refreshments, hors d'oeuvres, everything you need to sustain yourself for the next few hours. Not the reception goes for a few hours, I just mean your caloric intake, right? All right, so that's the what, here's the who. Today we have the pleasure of welcoming as our guest, Martin Robinson, who comes to us all the way from London. Not London, Ontario, London, UK. Professor Robinson sharpened his axe as a teacher of theater and English. He worked in state schools in London for over 20 years. It's confusing in England, I think, because if you say public school, that actually means private school, right? So state school means public school. Uh, and he was so good at teaching and so passionate about it that eventually he started having to teach teachers. And he got called into schools to look at how they teach and help them do it better. So that's how he came to found and direct 20, uh, Trivium 21st Century Limited, where he works with schools on designing curricula, managing classrooms, and communicating effectively. He's published three books, including one called Trivium 21C, which I was going to bring to brandish. Thank you. And he's a professor leading policy and research on curriculum and assessments for Academica University. So Professor Robinson's been invited to give talks all over the world on what he's going to be talking to us today. So we're lucky to have him in Providence today. And he's warned me that he's going to do interactive things. and He's going to ask you questions. So stay on your toes and give a warm welcome to our guest, Martin Robinson. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you for your lovely introduction and thank you for inviting me over the pond. Quite a long way to come for you, but uh, I don't mean that in a horrible way. It's nice to see you all and thank you for coming. You're, you're very spread out, yeah, sort of to the wings and no one wants to be close, obviously. I don't blame you. Um, I'm going to talk to you about trivial things really trivial things, things that really don't matter at all, and therefore don't be scared of it. It doesn't matter, all right? It's just a bit of trivia. Trivia, okay? So, um, but first, I just, I had an email today about this, and um, it mentioned dress code. I don't know if you saw it. It said um, business casual or professional Normal. Did it say, no, that's the way I read it. Is this normal? 
All right, okay. You see, coming from 1960s London, that was sort of business and casual didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, that, that was it. So what I'm looking at with business casual is a sort of oxymoronic formulation. Right? Now, the idea that two things can happen... This is Marshall McLuhan. He's a, he comes from Edmonton. He's a country near you, apparently, up north. Um, and he was well into oxymoronic formulations. Okay? One of his most famous is Global Village, all right? Which is ridiculous when you think about it. There is no way you can have a global village, and yet here we are, apparently, in a global village. You, you there with your Apple laptop open, ready to X away? Is it tweet away, X away? Whatever it is, you're going to do it anyway. The global village. So I want you to think all the way through this, about oxymoronic formulations, really. How contradictory things can then come together and somehow tell a different truth, a new truth about something. So two things that perhaps don't fit together, fit together. Okay? Now, Marshall McLuhan's PhD at Cambridge was on the classical trivium. And he took the history of the trivium right from its beginnings up to the Renaissance, okay? the heyday, the heyday of the classical trivium. And afterwards, it sort of fell into decline, arguably. And I'm going to argue that it actually didn't, but various things happened. So we'll get there. And I, I think it's still there, underpinning your education, underpinning this talk, underpinning the way you think. And when it goes wrong, so does your thinking. But we'll come to that. We'll come to that. Here is my book, which is over there. And I've been, I've been to um, look at the uh, two best res um, reviews on Amazon. <laughs> Perhaps one of the most important books of any educated ever. The author is a genius. Thanks, Mum. <laughs> and the other one, boring. So, you know, you take your pick. But um, perhaps you, you can be a boring genius, I suppose, couldn't you? <laughs> yeah, I suppose you can. I mean, most geniuses probably are a bit dull in their own way. But I want to go back to this, and, and fascinatingly, I said, when just that, I went to the loo, not, I'm not going to talk about that wasn't fascinating, but on the way to the, the journey there, the first picture I saw was this, the School of Athens by Raphael. If you go to the Vatican, some of you I'm sure have, or should have been, um, you've been to the Vatican, you go to the, um, the museum, yeah, and you wander around the museum. And if you do what I do, you go Sistine Chapel, and you go round and you round and round and round, and you completely miss, because it's on the back wall. I went round three times and had to ask for a special dispensation to get told to turn at the right point, and I've seen it in its all its finery. Recommend it. Beautiful place to go, but what a picture. Here. We have, this, this is a test now. Plato. Thank you. And, and? Aristotle. Very good. Plato and Aristotle, the two beginnings of um, perhaps we call Western philosophy, but not necessarily. It's, it sort of sits in between perhaps West and East. But this chap here, Heraclitus, is of most interest, mainly because I played him. <laughs> And there I am. That's, a, at the, uh, that's not in Athens. That is actually in St. Paul's in London. But, and we had to get a special permission to actually use those steps. But there you go. Doesn't really help anything. Here we go. Look, I'm going to talk to you about the trivium. Trivia. Trivium. Now, three things. So again, just three things. All you have to remember, I wouldn't take notes if I were you, you two. No, it's, a very, it's very nice you're taking notes, but I really wouldn't bother. Right, three things. It's all three things. You can remember three things without taking notes, all right? So three things. Here we go. We have, you've got to learn stuff. Number one, learn stuff. This is very basic, I'm putting it. It's going to get a bit more interesting and complicated, but learn stuff. And you've got to express stuff. So you're taking notes there, thinking you're learning stuff here. It's really important. It isn't. It's trivial. And you're writing it down. And then you could turn it into an essay or a TikTok. Yeah? Now, It'd be a, it would be a boring TikTok, but there, you do that. And then 
in between those two things, there's the bit in between. Okay? So three things. Learning stuff, expressing stuff, and the bit in between. Now, the bit in between, of course, is important. It's not really the bit in between, but we'll talk about that in a bit. But here they are. Seven liberal arts. And we've got astronomy there, geometry, arithmetic, music. But we don't care about those four. That's the quadrivium. But I want you to forget about them. Okay? I'm most, most interested in grammatica, dialectica, rhetorica. Or grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric. The first three... No, look, have you heard of Shakespeare? So Shakespeare went to a grammar school in Warwickshire, Stratford-upon-Avon, in England. And he learnt the three liberal arts, grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric. And if you go through his plays, as Sister Mary Joseph has done, and you can get this book online from Amazon. If you look through it, she goes through all his plays and interprets them through the trivium. So, for instance, to be or not to be is a bit of dialectic. Yeah? Dialectic debate, weighing things up, thinking. But we'll come to that. So, instead of what I said earlier, grammar, learning stuff, knowledge, important things, foundational knowledge, rhetoric, expressing yourself beautifully, eloquently, thoughtfully, persuasively. And the bit in between Dialectic. Dialectic, otherwise also referred to as logic and also referred to as logos. Logos, logos. And again, we get into even more complications with those three. But I don't, I don't want to complicate it too much now. We'll just stick with the three things. Grammar, dialectic, rhetoric. Okay, but why liberal arts? There's seven liberal arts, but why liberal arts? Well, liberal for freedom, for the free person, but also to free the person. And arts, well, he was going to call it Isidore of Seville, this is, liberal discipline. Now, discipline is different to art, and we'll go through why in a sec. Art is defined by strict rules and precepts to begin with, drawn from opinion, resembles truth, and that's a problem, and can end up with a variety of different outcomes, virtues, or meanings. This is what Isidore of Seville wrote. As opposed to discipline, is based on true arguments, you could only reach one outcome or meaning. Ugh. Right, that's the boring stuff. That's, you can see why that person wrote boring. Now, why does this matter? What does it mean? Well, it means a discipline, if I taught you a discipline, I would want you to do exactly the same thing as I've taught you, again and again and again. If I want you, let's say there's a plumbing problem with a tap, I want you to put a washer in, do that, I wouldn't want you to experiment with it and go crazy and turn it into a, uh, a fountain. Yeah? I wouldn't want you to get creative with it. I'd want you to do the same thing. A discipline doing the same thing. An art you are free to express in your own way. Do the thinking for yourself. Or, perhaps this is a good way of expressing it. So what's a liberal arts course? You come to talks like this in order to freely think for yourself and to learn through people teaching you stuff that actually liberates you and your thinking to help create yourself, make yourself, remake yourself, to become, to be, and to become. And this, again, it's a, hello. <laughs> Saint Augustine, right on Saint Augustine, well done. Uh, <laughs> Who is so foolishly curious? Send 
his son. Can, by the way, we, we're going to get lots of this. His son and things like that. Daughters too. Yeah, <laughs> let's just uh, give them a bit of leeway on that. But to learn what the teacher thinks. In other words, if I was sending you to a school in North Korea, the likelihood is that you would be taught what the North Korean teacher thinks you should know, and that would be it. In North Korea, the people in charge of the country went to America and went to Catholic schools in America and said, we want teachers to come from there to teach us, us lot in charge, our children, to think freely because there's not enough creativity in this country. And so American educators from the Catholic tradition went over to North Korea and just taught the children of the elite. And every now and then, one Catholic teacher got sent back to America because there's only a certain amount of freedom of thought that you're allowed in North Korea. And they went too far. There's a lovely documentary about it. It used to be on YouTube. I don't know if it still is. This is Dorothy L. Sayers. She wrote um, detective fiction. But here we go. Also, that comes from it, not only free thinking, but you also learn how to learn. So the trivium starts to shape towards free thinking through a shape where you learn stuff, think about stuff, and express stuff, and learn ways of doing all three successfully, and builds up to that point. Anything not doing that, why, why learn anything if it's just not teaching you to think? John of Salisbury knew this in the 1100s. Anyone know what that is or where it is? Come on. I... Shut. So this is a, a cathedral in northern France, Chartres Cathedral. And over the west doors, there is this. You've got Ptolemy there, you've got um, Boethius, you've got Cicero, but you've also got, well, from Aristotle, you've got dialectic, rhetoric, you've got all seven liberal arts and grammar. I'm just going to look at those three, remember. So here they are. There we've got grammar, dialectic and rhetoric. We're going to start with rhetoric. Poor, poor woman. She looks a bit, a bit worn out, shall we say. <laughs> She's seen better days. But there she is. She's holding, I think it's some sort of cloth. Yeah, and she's holding it up. And she's saying how beautiful it is. She's trying to persuade you of its beauty, of its use perhaps. You can cuddle up to it if you're cold, whatever it is. She's trying to persuade you that this is a good thing. There she is, okay? Persuasive rhetorica, rhetoric, using argument, using thoughtful, structured argument to persuade you that she is right about something. And then we have dialectica. There she is. And in one hand, well, she has this strange sort of lizard-like creature. And in the other hand, I think it's France, it's probably an onion, but some, some sort of vegetation. And she's holding them both up, comparing, contrasting. You know, they're obviously pretty easy to contrast. <laughs> yeah? But, you know, there they go. Comparing, contrasting, weighing up the differences between the two. And here we have grammar. Grammar. Can I say, look, in those days, grammar was slightly different to our understanding of it today. But here she is. Look, we've got two... Students, here and here. And she's towering over them on a dais. You, you know, the teachers in the old days, I mean old days, we're talking a few centuries ago, the Victorian times, used to sit on a high chair so they could look down on you, students, quite rightly, and look down on you because of authority. I am up here, you are down there. I am towering above you. This is important knowledge. You need to know this. Yeah? And, and quite rightly so. And in her hand, she has a book. 
And it's probably the same book as those two have got. It's probably a textbook. No, it's probably the Bible or a Latin primer, one or the other. When you've only got two books, a curriculum's quite easy to sort of work out. But there you go. So it's one of the two. And the kids there have got the same, I've called them kids, students here, got the same things here. And I think this one's sort of finding it a bit more difficult than that one. And in, in one hand, she has the book. But in the other hand, and this is of great interest, she has a weapon, a weapon of mass instruction. And there she is, and it's going, sum es est, sumus estis. Or oh, you were lucky, because you would have got hit. Hit. I have a friend called Ken Campbell, who's no longer with us, unfortunately. But Ken Campbell learnt in a place called Chingford. Uh, Chigwell. Actually, I've got that wrong. Chigwell. And he learnt at school just after the war. And he said, do you know, Martin, because he spoke with an Essex drawl, we call it. Do you know, Martin, when I was at school, I was taught violent Latin. <laughs> violent Latin. Yes? But I'll tell you one thing, it worked. <laughs> I know my Latin. So... So, you know, if in doubt, hit people, they will learn. But that, that's the idea. So authority. This is the right knowledge. And if you don't get it, we're going to hit you. All right? So that's pretty important stuff. Would you learn it if you're going to get hit? Or would you sort of uh, cheat a bit? I don't know. So grammar. You start with foundational knowledge. Like a building. You need the foundation. Big ideas, what we could call knowledge rich. The importance of knowing stuff. And also the importance that this stuff that you are learning is good stuff. The right stuff to learn. And, I, and we can get all, we're going to get into problems, I know. I know it more than you do. I've got there already. It's problematic, but it's good stuff. Okay? And then dialectic. You practice this stuff. Or you experiment with it, you explore, develop your own knowledge, etc. You start to think of arguments, debating, comparing, contrasting, criticizing. And you start to develop your own thoughts. And then, and this is what Zeno called rhetoric, you learn to express your ideas and reach out to the world with an open hand. A hand of care, of love. You reach out. It's your way into the world. In other words, it's going on Twitter. I, I still call it Twitter. And you know people go on Twitter with love, care, <laughs> and everything like that. De definitely. And it formed the basis of the medieval universities. Bologna. Oxford in this case. And I'll tell you about uh, an Oxbridge education. So Oxford and Cambridge. Oxbridge. You go there, and you, you were, in the medieval days, taught stuff, grammar. And then you go to tutorials. And in the tutorials, you sit there in a small group of two or three of you and your tutor. And you discuss stuff. And then you have to go away and think about that stuff and come back with a speech, a viva. And you talk it. And your tutor would listen and then slowly unpick it, <laughs> take it apart. Now, they don't do the viva, they do an essay instead. And they do an essay at least one a week. One essay a week through this system. In other words, grammar, you're taught stuff, and then dialectic, you think about it, discuss it, unpick it, do all those things, and rhetoric is your expression of the stuff in the essay. In other words, it's a trivial, in the old sense, education. You're being taught through the trivium. Now, they got a bit bored of teaching grammar. You know, the hitting of people and all that. Got a bit boring. So they set up schools especially to do that. And they were called grammar schools. And where the term grammar school comes from is that, taking it out of Oxbridge, setting up schools for that. And you'd leave Oxford or Cambridge at the age of about 12, your university education, and go into the priesthood or the law, something like that. Okay.
Now, it was, goes right back to ancient Greece. At some point, the Greeks lost the tradition. And the tradition was kept by Muslim countries and scholars. And this is one of them here, known in the West as Averroes, talking about which here, about the grammar, the dialectic and rhetoric, and starting to connect it to a religion, if you like. If you look over to Confucius, he talks about a similar way of thinking about education. Francis Bacon talks of it as the tradition. He calls it organ, method, and illustration. It's the beginning of scientific method. The trivium, I would argue, is the beginning of the scientific method in the modern sense. And bearing in mind, whatever the scientific method happens to be, there's arguments even about that. Dorothy L. Sayers, you can go online now if you've actually got your thing in front of you like you have. You could go on there and look at Lost Tools of Learning. And in that, she talks about pole parrot, purse, and poetic. And she puts the trivium into three stages of learning at schools. Now, I don't think this is the best way to do it, but it is a way of thinking about it. And a lot of these ideas have been taken up by the homeschooling movement in America. And I think Susan Bauer has done a lot of work on, on this sort of way of talking about the trivia. I love this about rhetoric, the interrelatedness of knowledge, where all things come together, the logos. C.S. Pierce, who I've heard described as the best American philosopher of all time, who never wrote a book, but wrote lots of pamphlets and various things like that, and pieces of work. He talks about grammar. I'm sorry, he talks about trivium and uses it as the basis of his philosophy. Triadic organization. And he uh, divides it up like this. Notice the word of speculative grammar and the importance that that change might have. Instead of hitting people, <laughs> you will learn this, it's right. We're getting to a point of thinking, might this be right? And he puts rhetoric right up there as the master art. Heidegger, flawed person, without a doubt, literally a Nazi. But apart from that, uh, <laughs> his three things here, teaching us to speak right. Isn't a right a funny word? But in German, it probably sounds better. Teaches us to reason a right, teaches us to speak and reason well. Marshall McLuhan, so this is where we came in, sort of. His description of the trivium, connecting in the global village. Howard Gardner from Harvard. If you come out of school or college and you can't do those three things, you could consider the education to be a failure, perhaps. Almost definitely. And Steve Jobs. I suppose, he, you see, he used to be new, didn't he? It used to be exciting, but he's now really old news. He probably died before some of you were born. But anyway, <coughs> there he is. Apple. A good quote for liberal arts courses everywhere. Right, bring the best things possible into your world. And look, who's got, you've got Apple products. Who, who else has got an Apple product? Right. Now, lots of Apple products originally, up until quite recently, were designed by a chap from Chingford 
in northeast London, went to school in Chingford, northeast London, went off to Newcastle Polytechnic in the northeast of England, and he basically follows the trivium in his design ideas. So I'm going to show you how that can be. We have absolutely nothing. Do you, do, I'm going to show you a picture now, and some of you might remember it. This is, a, this is an age test. That is called the Sony Walkman. Now, some people might actually, nowadays, trendily have one, you know, to be a bit sort of wacky. But this is the Sony Walkman. Do you, what he did, you could, it's amazing when it came out. You had a Sony Walkman, you put it there in your pocket or something like that, and you could put a cassette. Yeah, that doesn't help, does it? Right, but a cassette. You put this thing with sort of tape and music on it, and you put it in there, click it in, and it would play music in your earphones. It was amazing. And you, 30 minutes later, it would stop. And you'd go, oh, and you had to take it out, open it up, turn the cassette round, put it back in, and off you go. And there you go. Yeah. And 30 minutes later, no more music. So you bring another cassette with you, and then another cassette, and then, another, and then you're weighed down with loads of cassettes. And you could shuffle them by changing them quickly and all sorts of things. It's an amazing invention. Right, for some reason, this became totally useless. And people said, ah, that's a bit, you know, having to change the cassette. And then every now and then, it would eat your cassette as well. The, the tape would get stuck in it, go, and come out, and it would be, you, you remember this, Father, yeah. Got completely ruined. So it sort of went out of fashion. But there was thinking at Apple, hang on a minute. We could do something with this because of these new silicon chip things. Yeah? And Sony thought about it and dismissed the idea. They thought it was completely out, no point. But Apple said, we're going to do this, all right? And they brought in Johnny Ive. Right, how can you make something interesting out of this? How can you design it? And Johnny Ive, his dad, was a design and technology teacher into design. And he remembers going to school, the same school as David Beckham, by the way, for, and Harry Kane. But anyway, no, it's strange that these three went to this sort of a trivium of their own. Anyway, they'd go to school with his dad, and he'd say, look at that, his dad would look at, and they'd look at a lamppost. They'd say, what do you think of that one? Is it too, it's rounded at the top, that's beautiful. And he learned about beauty, and he learned about eloquence in design. And he goes through all these things. And he, when he got to Newcastle Polytechnic, he really got into a company called Braun. And he thought Braun designs were the best. The best that has been thought, said, and done in technology in the idea of design. Okay? Now, I'm going to show you something. This might offend some of you. This is a Braun product. And it's a transistor radio. Okay? From the 1950s. There. Now, Johnny Ive said, I've got just the idea. I'm going to take the best that's been thought and said. I'm going to put the Walkman and the silicon chip together. And I'm going to design something new and beautiful and eloquent that is human, like you know, human scale, that is be beautiful to hold and touch and use, just like Braun used to do, which made them wonderful. And so he did. Now, you might think he ripped it off, <laughs> and you might be right, because there's a lot going on there that was there before. But that is kind of how the trivium works. Your knowledge, connecting it to other things, thinking about it, how it works, and expressing yourself in some way, something beautiful, something new. Okay. Now. I'm going to go on to more things in a minute. But what I want you to think about is anything you know in your way of learning, your way of doing things, in any subject, perhaps your own work or other people's work that you've been in, classes and things like that, that have worked in a similar way. That you've brought ideas in, you're allowed to cogitate, to think about, to work, to practice, and then to express in some way. Okay? Just, I'm going to give you one minute to do that by the person nearest to you, whether you know them or not.
Okay, off you go. Okay, now, I told you it was a minute. Now, we're going to get to 2023. Where the three ways meet. That's trivium, where the three ways meet. Argue, cancel, block, shout at each other, fight. Grammar, tradition, capital C, culture, alternative tenets or texts, the best. Dialectic, critical faculties engaged, searching for agreement using reason. You can tell which one I like, by the way I've phrased it. <laughs> um, alternative narratives, facts, telling your own truth, identity, the rhetoric of today. Now, in other words, these things change over time. They're a tradition. Things change over time. And the problem is, things can go wrong. So I'll give you, have you ever read Stoner? Yeah? It's a great book. I liked it. And every airport or train station in England seems to have this in there. I don't know why. But Stoner, it's a great novel. I'd read it. It's also got three to five, I think it is, pages about the trivium in the middle, strangely enough. And this is one of the things it says. Twentieth century. In other words, when I was at school in the 1960s and 70s, I was never taught anything about grammar. There was nothing. We, f we were to learn grammar through creative writing and things like that. In other words, rhetoric and dialectic would carry us through. No grammar, because that's telling people what to think, and, and, and was too, they were thinking of it in the authoritarian sense. Now, I think now this is slightly different. So which of the three arts and now taken away. And can you bear in mind, the trivium's like a three-legged stool. You take one bit away, and it fails. It falls. And I think now, one of the reasons, and this is probably overreaching, but I don't care. <laughs> I think we've got grammar to rhetoric. Facts. My facts. I'm going to tell you this, whether you like it or not. Without the thinking. Kind of. And it's, you know, let's have a look. What's dialectic? And by the way, I'm very into simple terminology. Dialectic, if I really went into it, would be more than one little slide. Okay, because I haven't even gone into Hegel, let alone Marx, let alone, uh, there's a lot more to it. But this is an explanation for it. Slightly different to dialogic. Even that, even agreeing to disagree, I think is a problem nowadays. And this is expressed as the two in even shorter way by Richard Sennett. So here. This is the core argument, if you like, the core contradiction between grammar and dialectic. Now, on one side, we have the importance of tradition, 
of things being the same, of home, of family, of religion, of a book, or a tradition of books, a canon. On the other hand, we have people saying, no, that is wrong. What you say is wrong. And this is right. And this is how we should be instead. And this sort of goes, permeates education and education discussions and universities and people. This uh, tension. Now, I think to be truly educated, a sign of being truly educated is holding both of those together. In other words, embracing the contradiction. And I'll, I'll go into really why. This is another way of expressing the same thing. Which I like, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but even Derrida talks about the importance of a canon. Derrida is, is to want of a better term, a sort of cultural studies hero of the Marxist tradition. In other words, to deconstruct something, you need to know about it. You can't deconstruct now. Sorry, nothing. <laughs> I'm going into colloquialism. There we go. Keats is lovely on this. So this is Keats writing. And this is what I'm calling about holding the two at some point. to be able to hold the contradictions with empathy, love, and respect, and not try and reconcile them too quickly, impatiently, to give them time to grow. Michael Oakeshott, the voice of liberal learning. In other words, how do we go from culture war back to culture? It's not being dismayed by not reaching a conclusion straight away. But thought takes longer than perhaps one TikTok. So a dialectical way of looking at it. And by the way, those of you who think this is a Hegelian dialectic, it isn't, but it's the way it's sometimes expressed wrongly. But anyway, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Here's what I think. Here's a book. Now we're going to look through it, critique it, think about it. But now we're going to try and take those two things and try and reach some sort of agreement about it that brings us in both. In other words, it's not just boring. It's usually a work of genius, I think you'll find. <laughs> or, and, and to avoid this. But it's my opinion, and I'm allowed to say what I think. Sorry, that's with a sort of slightly East London accent. And this is a reason why you've got to avoid that sort of a... Take. This is up-to-date research, by the way. It's August 2023, 20, so not bad, a month old. Yeah, well, it's my opinion, and that's why I think conspiracy theories are probably right. And, uh, yeah, okay, that contradicts that, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, that's not nonsense. That's not nonsense. Some of these people are being sort of locked up at the moment, aren't they, in the 6th of January? No. Anyway, uh, the subjective truth. And unfortunately, these, these people in their survey who believe in this truth is completely subjective sort of idea, it's my opinion, it's all right. Strangely, don't give that right to other people. Yeah, well, I think this. I think that whatever it happens to be, yeah, usually about something or other. But you're wrong. You can be wrong, but my truth is right. Your truth is wrong. 
because, of course, it can't quite work. So, look, here we go. This is Matthew Arnold. You can, he's, he's got rather wonderful facial hair. And he talked about culture being the best that's been known and said. Okay? Now, the grammar. The grammar of culture, the tradition, the important things. And that's kind of what he meant. Okay? Now, before you go into your dialectical phase, I want you to accept this. I'm going to hit anyone who disagrees. Okay? <laughs> this is, for those of you who don't know, why don't you know? This is Beethoven, this is Shakespeare, and this is the Mona Lisa. Yes? Leonardo da Vinci. All dead white men who did, uh, of course, yeah, but all that. But there you go. Is there a better composer? I was doing this the other day, and someone mentioned MC Hammer. <laughs> MC Hammer was better than Beethoven. No! Beethoven's better than MC Hammer. Fact. <laughs> right. OK. So who's better than Shakespeare? No one. No one is better than Shakespeare. Shakespeare is the greatest writer of all time. Fact. Leonardo da Vinci. He knew what to do with a brush. He even invented the helicopter. Never took off, but that doesn't matter. Yeah. Genius. That's proper genius, not like this geezer here. <laughs> this is genius. Right. Now, look, whether you agree or disagree, let's, let's get it down to coffee. Which is the best cup of coffee? Now, I'm going to, I don't want you to say anything yet. I'm going to show you a slide here. Some of you are going to be offended by some of it. I want you to decide which is the best cup of coffee. Don't say anything yet. Stop. <laughs> Great. You're hit even. That's not much easier. When <laughs> that's good. There's violent coffee drinking. No. Right. Here we go. So look at those. Which is the best cup of coffee? Tell the people around you. Off you go. You've got to argue with someone. You can't just sit there and not argue. argue. Tell them. Now. Now. The answer. The answer is, and I'm not going to, this is filter coffee. So none of your cappuccino rubbish. All right? So this here, D4, that ain't a cappuccino. That's, that's milk. Right? B2 is the best one. Fact. Fact. <laughs> Truth. Okay? Now, there's a dialectic going on. In other words, you and your co-conspirator in all this, or conspirator was, I want you to come to an agreement about which is the best one. Okay? If you already agree, you've got it easy. But you've got to try and argue against me if you don't agree with me. Okay? So think of the way that you're going to prove that I'm wrong. Dialectic, we must reach agreement. Dialogic, you can agree to differ, but respect each other. But this is a dialectic, so you can't do that. No, yes, my opinion, so that's it. No, fact, which is the best one. Off you go, quickly. And stop. Now. Now. Imagine. Imagine being there and not caring about coffee. You know, not liking coffee. Yeah? You had to then sort of take a step up and say, well, uh, with complete ignorance, you're, you're helping that person sort of going through that. But look, you had to come. Can you imagine trying to put together a liberal arts curriculum? If you can't agree on a damn coffee, <laughs> what books are you going to teach? In what order? Yeah? All those sorts of things. You can see, and especially if you're passionate about certain things and not other things. You hate that, but I like that. Yeah? And another thing, I lied to you. I'm English. 
that's T. <laughs> go on then, same thing, off you go. Best, <laughs> best bit of toast, off you go. And stop, now. For a start, if there's a good scientist in the room, they probably discounted this part over here, because carcinogenic, too, too burnt, not going to do you any good. In fact, a true scientist would say A1. In other words, bread is the best bit of toast. <laughs> um, but there you go. So look, I mean, obviously that lot isn't even toast. That's nonsense up there. Um, if you go to this uh, posh hotels, one in um, Paris, one in London, called the Ritz, yeah? you go to that hotel, ask for toast, they give it to you. Yeah? You go to other hotels, like the cheap ones I usually stay in when I'm traveling England, and they've got this strange toaster with a conveyor belt in it. And if you get behind someone who likes toast, over there, you wait for hours as their toast goes round and round and round. Yeah? because they think they want that sort of toast. You go to the Ritz, I tell you, they give you toast, you accept it, because they have spent hours and hours on courses how to make the best toast. And they're giving you the best toast. And if you argue, you're the loser. Yeah, they know the best, okay? Because they've studied it. So, and others of you are saying, but that's not even bread, proper bread. I mean, where's the sourdough? Where's the sort of uh, seeded bread and all this is white, bloody white, sliced nonsense. Yeah? Don't like it. Okay. I am now, some of you might cry now. I cry. This is the most beautiful picture ever drawn. Most beautiful picture known to humanity. Oh, yeah, E. H. Shepherd. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it fine? Does it remind you of perhaps important things? Love, A parent, perhaps reading to you, perhaps. But it just of itself, just of itself. Look at the expression with so few lines. Absolute beauty. And now, this one. This is shit. <laughs> of course it's rubbish. It's all, look, look what, how could you do that? How could you do that? Take something so beautiful and then do that to it. Could you imagine? Yeah? Why have you done that to it? This one, uh, a bit more difficult, perhaps. And then some people say, why are you having a go at Disney? Yeah, you just hate Disney. Disney own all those pictures. They own the E.H. Shepherd. Yeah? They actually own that. So I'm not having a go at Disney. Not this, on this occasion. But look, if you actually think that that is good, can you imagine? I think that's good. It's my opinion. It's good. Right. How the hell can you work this one out? This is Jeff Koons called Balloon Dog. Now you can imagine, if you think that that is good, and you're hit with that, you've only got one choice. It's good. But it isn't good. <laughs> Balloon Dog is rubbish. But the point is, you see, the whole thing about Jeff Koons, who's making it, is to say, this is rubbish. In other words, what we call kitsch. And if you don't understand kitsch, if you don't go into that museum and go, what the hell's that? You ain't got it. If you go there and say, that's really wonderful, it's beautiful. It's amazing, it speaks. If you say that, then you haven't understood what's going on. 
you haven't got to the truth of what the artist is meaning. And here, teachers. This teacher, cleared, this is Austin's butterfly. It's quite a famous thing in assessment terms for teachers. Right? And you can see here which one the teacher thinks is best. Because the teacher has framed it and written Austin's name on it. So the teacher thinks that one is best. But the teacher is wrong. The best one, there's two arguably best ones here. Number one and number four. Number one, because it's naive, authentic, immediate response. And number four, because the same thing with the E.H. Shepherd. It's fine lines. It says what it is in few lines. Use a minimalist approach. It has space within the line. and tells you what it needs to tell you. But no, this teacher thinks realism is best. Wants it to look real. Yeah, God knows where this teacher would get with Picasso. He got gradually worse <laughs> over time. Yeah, as it gets worse and worse and worse. Look at him, 89, that poor old... Yeah, he's gone. <laughs> he's lost it completely there. So which is best? But not only best, how to make it prevail for the good of all humankind. But some things are better than other things. What's the date today? Is it the 8th? Exactly one month ago to this day, my mother died. She was 94 years old. What do I have left? Some things matter because they've been given to you. And you remember them. And they stay with you and shape you. The tradition of my family, if you like. The living truth, she is alive within me. She is dead. And she is alive. Contradiction. Do I conserve those feelings and teach my daughter about her? Or do I ignore them and throw them away? The grammar, the conservation of things before, the cultural products of things before, <laughs> things my mother loved and cared for. Do I pass that on? And can I hold it in a sense of conflict with others? Now, these two Edwardian black women here, that's my grandmother and her sister. Now, I stand in front of you now, completely divorced from this culture, to look at and by time. How much do I hold of what they... She died when I was... My grandmother died when I was about six. I remember her sister, Aunt Bird, who used to make sausage and mash. As Jamaican as you could get. <laughs> Not at all. And these are the questions I think we have to ask about culture 
Is it fixed or fluid? Is it owned or is it shared? A unity in opposites or a unity in diversity? And this one I want you to look at very carefully because I think it encapsulates the problem and the solution. The very thing she most admires, she wants to change. And by changing it, paradoxically, she might lose what she most admires. Paradoxical. The grammar and the dialectic. She's doing it with love and care for the things she wants to change. Not through anger and destruction, but through thought and for her position within that, of course. Can you discuss that with the people around you, and then I'll take some questions or some comments. Okay, now, I've gone through a lot of things, and I've made some leaps of faith, and um, skirted over things, so anything that's not understood from what I'm trying to say, please ask, because clarity is really helpful, and then we can share exactly where my thinking is on these things. Plus, if there's anything you'd want to say, to argue with, please do, because that's the whole point. What's that? I didn't hear it. Begin with the student. Yep. So the pressure's on. <laughs> Did you bring your... Um my whipping. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to start here with you two because you've got the, the. Because you're on that side. Would you would you be so kind as to, thank you. There we go. Um, hi, I'm Lauren Carson. I'm a junior here. Thank you so much for your talk. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I'm just curious. So you mentioned how we're lacking the dialectic in like our modern academic settings. And so I was just curious how, like, what specific steps us as students could take to go about facilitating the dialectic in our classrooms 
especially if other students aren't keen on coming to collaborative agreement, like how, like what specific things we could do um, to make that better? Right, it's a really good question and it probably hasn't got an answer. Because if you've got people there who won't play the game, just as I think on January the 6th, there were people there who won't play the game of the Constitution, in my mind. So if you've got people who are not going to take part, you're in a very difficult place. The only way to do it is to have a strong enough voice of those who will. In other words, the silent ones who perhaps don't say much, coming together, coming to an agreement, or by making sure you speak like you just have in class first and take that leap. And also, and the two slides, three slides I showed about how to deal with instant anger within yourself and to overcome that and to think that the pursuit of truth or whatever for all is more important at this moment than my individual feelings and to try and express that with others. Because if you're going to hold a true liberal arts thing, in other words, put the conservative and the radical together and discuss both of those as if they are equally true, even though you don't believe they are, is the proper place of an education. In other words, you can't have opinions, you can only have educated opinions. But that takes time, and it takes trust. I think trusting your, your teachers and each other, because imagine saying something in class and then people arguing with you out of class because of it. So actually being strong enough as a student body to say this is important, the, the overall pursuit of truth, and I say the word truth, is important. Yeah? There's a lovely thing. Do you know Mary Midgley, a philosopher? Right, Mary Midgley talks about the aquarium. You've got Russell's teapot. You've now got Midgley's aquarium. Okay? Midgley's aquarium is the truth is on the inside of this aquarium. None of us can see that. We all look through little parts of the aquarium. Some of these things are covered in mildew and things that they can't see hardly anything at all and these different ways of seeing it, yet we're all looking through and what actually we need to do is make sure we all share our own perspectives. Yeah? Perspectivism. Not relativism, perspectivism. That we all have a view upon the truth and we're all coming to... The only way to find out the truth is to make sure we all honestly share our own viewpoints, no matter how covered they are in different, making it more difficult for some of us than others. Yeah? So that sort of analogy perhaps might help. I don't know. Thank you. Hello, my name is Holly. I teach uh, theology here. Um... So you did say a lot of things. There were a lot of quotations. <laughs> um, and you did gloss over a few things. Hugely. And, you know, I think at one point in your presentation, you even just sort of said bluntly, you know, we just have to hold these two together. But um, it seems to me that there is a linchpin, actually, in the way that you've presented uh, your own perspective, which I think you have. I think you've given us your perspective on these matters, even if obliquely. And um, I don't think it's a speculative linchpin. I think it's a practical linchpin. And I think it's love. Sorry? I think it's love. Love. I thought you said sloth. That's what, yeah, sloth. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Love. No, I think you're absolutely... Poor reasoning, really. That's the center of the whole thing. Yeah. Does that... Um, do you think so? And could you... If, if you think so, you've used the word now quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, a number of times. But what do you think that word means? If you, yeah. if you agree with me that it, you, you yourself take it as central. Yeah. 
and, and different forms of the Greek idea of what love, love is. So not romantic love, but love for your fellow person, but love for truth as well. So what another word perhaps is wisdom, um, you know, philosophia, the love of knowledge. Um, so the, these sort of ideas um, that love is an important feeling rather than hate for those things, you know, as, as well. But uh, I, would, I would say that. It's, it's, it's very much rooted in philosophy and philosophical thought. Um, but, of course, within philosophical thought, there's a lot of conflict and a lot of hate as well. So you also think, rather than the ego, this is my view, is more important than yours, it's love for the knowledge itself and love for the communal pursuit of knowledge. So, as, as Oakshot calls it, the conversation of mankind, the conversation of humanity, that we are all within this together. Could well. I just add a quick comment? Yeah, please. It seems to me just the way you've just said that uh, marks out a course that in a way um, moves between the description that you gave of discipline and the description that you gave of arts, which was quite open-ended, you know, any you re, in in your initial definition, it seemed to allow any expression. Um, but the love of truth, in a sense, goes between those two. Um, yeah, but you've also got the freedom to be wrong. Yeah, but then you would use the word wrong to describe. Yeah, it. but people have the the, the re, you know to to be wrong in at that moment as well. Yeah, absolutely. Could be so something like. A Van Gogh in their lifetime perhaps is not good, yeah. but later on it becomes good, but there is time over time. You I'll know, just say super briefly that I think it's possible that in the initial definition of arts um, that we um, late, exhausted late modern Americans hear relativism, you know, and yeah. I mean, I'm exhausted, I don't know about everybody else. I may be coming from a complete wrong angle. Any comment about discussion in a in a school group or even in society and everything versus people saying and doing to make money in a capitalist society? Um, because you know the one seems idealistic and the other one is totally materialistic, and they cause all kinds of problems when they crash. Yeah, so there's, I mean, in a lot of cultural theory, the battle between folk culture and popular culture, and the idea that people say, well, folk culture comes from below, but a lot of popular culture is imposed from above and using exploitative methods <laughs> to get people to like something that isn't necessarily good, but it's going to make lots of money. I was talking to one of your students earlier about Barbie, the movie. Um, and you could argue that this is a feminist movie, or you could argue this is a very good marketing tool by Mattel that has managed to get into the zeitgeist and exploit brilliantly. And, and what's the best-selling toy <laughs> at the moment? You know, Barbie's up there. So um, it's part of the dialogue. I think that has to be part of the dialogue. I think you have to bring those concerns and thoughts in, but not necessarily, because she gave a good argument as to why it's a good movie and why it's not just that. Um, and she may be right. Um, but there is something along the lines that the thinking behind why that movie was made, I think it's more making money and marketing, but... I think, you know, I think you're right, but it's, it's still part of the conversation. Is that a wrong thing, in other words? Is it wrong to market a film? There's some great films out there. Was that one of them, though? Is it the best? There's a discussion for class. Is it a good movie? There's a discussion for class, and people are free to make up their own mind, but you certainly bring that into the conversation, yeah. Hello. 
Thanks so much for your presentation this afternoon. Um, I, is it on? Yep. Yep. Uh, my question about, is provoked by the really interesting connection you made about the separation out of grammar schools at some point into a kind of earlier, almost preparatory stage. So my question, I'm wondering if you've thought about this very much, is um, these three stages, should there be a kind of set order to them, a progression, a temporal progression? Or are they supposed to exist all at once, at all times? And I ask this partly because here at PC and in the DWC program, we're reflecting on what it might mean to think of a particular semester as maybe linked especially to one of these three or not. Maybe they should all be in play at once. So I'm very interested in if you thought much about how these are separated out when they're present in an education. Yeah, hugely. Um, and Structure-wise, if you think of them as completely separate, it doesn't quite work because there's lots of overlap. Um, there is the grammar of rhetoric, the grammar of dialectic, for example. Um, so because they overlap, there is a sort of logical progression that you need foundational knowledge, the foundation first, to preload knowledge, if you like. But can you imagine just learning your scales on piano and never playing a piece <laughs> or never composing a piece till the end. So you do two, you know, perhaps two semesters of going through your scales and doing practice like that and then before you play a tune and then before you compose. So there's always this question of balance between the three. The point is, depending on what you're teaching, the balance is different. And generally, the order, I would say, would be grammar, dialectic, rhetoric, but it doesn't have to be. You could start with a question and move your way into the grammar, for example. Um, but generally, yes, there is a logical thing, but it goes round and round and round and repeats and repeats and repeats as new knowledge comes to you so that you build on previous knowledge that you've got building new knowledge, the grammar comes in again. And when you do your rhetoric, it's the same with Oxford. You do the essay, the viva, and then you need more knowledge on top of that in order to move on. So there's, it, it goes around. Um, it's um, Dorothy L. Sayers who put the Lost Tools of Learning, she put it in a sort of strict one, two, three, which Susan Weisbauer, I think, is generally taken on, and a lot of homeschooling um, societies in America follow that, and I don't think that works, because you forget a lot of that preloaded knowledge when you get further on. So you do need to revisit, recall, reintegrate, rethink all the time. So it's, it's a circular. One more question, if there's any takers. How about over this end, I think there should be. You know, just, just for fun. <laughs> yeah, just keep walking. You'll, they'll, they'll, get, they'll think of something by the time you get there. The practical thing about this, you might be able to know the program includes um, almost uh, indispensably uh, shorter lectures and then longer seminars. Yeah. So we already have a structure that I think invites the um, taking up of different Right. elements of the trivium yeah. at different moments in the week in the yeah. week in I mean week. that I mean it certainly helps the structure of teaching is important hello if we have to have one more question before we can leave I'll I volunteer you're going to uh, ask it <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to make it quick <laughs> and I will um, first we saw a lot of quotes I'll just offer a quote that I like which is by a former president of uh, Bryn Mawr here in the United States. And she said, the purpose of education is to make your head a more interesting place to live in for the rest of your life. So I like that. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've thought of it quite this way, but someone who is educated in the trivium, which is to say, no stuff, um, can assimilate that stuff 
and then express him or herself, owns his own life. Whereas someone who can't is just a passive recipient of the opinions and uh, misopinions of others and may think he owns his own life because, hey, you know, that's my opinion and, and I'm entitled to it, but really doesn't. And I think if we could put it to young people that way um, as a reason to become educated in the manner that you have described, then that would be beneficial. I think that's, couldn't have put it better, sir, as they say. Um, the, the other thing is those who perhaps are educated differently, less formally, who are um, self-educated, if you like. Um, the process of the education is not just a formal one. In other words, you are always educating. And the good thing about the trivium, it gives you the structure to be able to do that. Um, and is a good way of thinking for when you are out of school, out of college, and to keep that going, or never been to as well, which is why some people who've found it, who've met very, particularly older people perhaps, who didn't get the education at school that they perhaps should have or would be entitled to nowadays, um, found it really helpful as a process of reading. Um, it was also um, things like in, in England, the Workers' Education Association set up um, by trades unions to educate themselves um, because they'd left school at 12. Um, that They set up this way of working in, in groups like that to, um, I've forgotten, uh, to bathe in the waters of knowledge. Um, Tawny, Reverend Tawny. So that, that idea of bathing in knowledge <laughs> and letting it flow over you and the importance of that. Um, and it gives you a structure for that. And, uh, you know, then people, certainly my parents' generation, felt the need to learn stuff. Nowadays, stuff, and it's a good word, because it just sort of levels everything. There's a lot of stuff out there, but is it the right stuff? <laughs> you know, is it good? How do you know? What are you measuring it against? How do you know that is true? And you're right. If you don't know anything to compare it to, you are easily misled, easily exploited. And that's a terrible thing. That's a great last question. If that is the last question, it is the last question. So I don't know if we, we, we tried to call in some toast from the Ritz. I don't know if it made it. <laughs> we do have other kinds of finger food right down the hall. Please give a warm round of applause to Martin Robinson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Any, any more questions in there? Then please do. Please chat. Ta very much.